Well, hi. Um, we're here with uh, Mary Stuckey, who's a professor of communications and political science at George State University. Or should I say it the other way around? It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. And uh, she, um, Mary is here to uh, give the uh, Kenneth Burke, Burke lecture today, and the title is uh, "Anger in, Poli in Presidential Rhetoric." Yeah, uh, the, the art of anger in political in elections. In political elections, and uh, we're very. Uh, very happy to have her here. Welcome to Penn State. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. So, um, you're a very prolific author, and you've done a lot of stuff on um, presidential rhetoric. And um, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and and it seems like there's there's this kind of uh, thread that, and tell me if I'm wrong, but that that I'm seeing that it's that you're looking at presidential rhetoric as the means by which presidents define the office and define the relationship of the office to the broader politic. Is that fair? That's actually very astute. Um, I, I'm trained as an institutionalist and I also study rhetoric, which is an informal process that both buttresses and can undermine institutions. So if you think about the, the rhetoric coming out of Fox News, for instance, for the last many years, they're constantly assaulting political parties, they're constantly assaulting institutions, they're, and that will eventually, to the extent that it affects people, can help distance people from their institutions. If you hear rhetoric that it's always about reforming an institution, like it works but we can make it better, then people are going to continue to trust their institutions. And so I look at those kinds of intersections of how that kind of rhetoric gets us to policy and what the institutional long-term consequences of it are. You clearly have this historical bent to your work too, and I'm wondering how some of these dynamics, to what degree are they new, to what degree are they just manifesting themselves in different ways? Yeah, this election, <laughs> right, like everyone else, right. and all right. I can say is, wow, that's unhinged. That's, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and by unhinged, I don't just mean that there's a certain level of lunacy that seems displayed, mm -hmm. but it also seems unhinged from many of the processes. So all of people who do kind of election forecasting, you know, people who are, have been in the game for a long time and we're like, yeah, we totally know what to expect. We're mm -hmm. all like, what? Because right, right, <laughs> like, right. there's so many things that are counterintuitive happening right now. And, and there's a bunch of reasons to study the historical context, and one of them is it's easier to look back and see what happened and to understand it as a way of trying to figure out what's happening now. Like It's much harder to get your hands around something that's mm -hmm. current. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that there, what political scientists talk about is moments of realignment. So there's a stable set of disputes that control the parties, and, and so we kind of know who a Democrat is and who a Republican is and what they believe. And then there are these moments where that gets completely ruptured. And it, it, it appears at the moment as if we're in one of those moments where it, everything gets ruptured. So if that's the case, then you start looking at analogs like the 1980 election or the 1932-36 elections where there were also ruptures. And then you can go back and say, oh, so that's what a rupture looks like. Mm -hmm. Is that what we have here? And, and these are the agents? Do you see commonalities there in terms of what accounts for what might be a rupture? Well, there's a couple of reasons why things might rupture. One of them is that there's an issue division and the issue gets solved. So prior to the Civil War, uh -huh. people argued about slavery. Right. After the Civil War, that was less of an issue. It was... And so you need different lines of demarcation uh -huh. between political uh -huh. beliefs. Um, so that's one reason, and another one is that the issue may just, instead of being solved, may just be less relevant, right, over mm -hmm. time, and mm -hmm. so that would be a sort of slow rupture rather than a big break, and both of those kinds of change are possible. Mm -hmm. um, right now, for instance, um, the, the, it seems to be a break, because <laughs> right. if the Republican Party implodes, as seems extremely likely at this mm -hmm. moment, mm -hmm. You can't blow up one party without having consequences for the other. So okay. if the Republicans are now seeking different ground on which to move ahead, that will affect the calculus that the Democrats have about what ground they choose to fight from, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. But I'm thinking about your uh, book about the 36 election. I mean, you have this, this uh, you know, landslide. 
and in 32 for obvious reasons, and then 36 people are going, hmm, this may not be working at quite as well as yeah. we thought, and there's, there's changes that we don't, aren't sure we necessarily like. So one way or another, this is going to impact the Democrats just as significantly. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's no, so everything that Roosevelt did, and partly he captured Republican issues, so it looks to me right now, hate making these kind of predictions because I know I'm going to be wrong, is that one of the big demographic battlegrounds will be the, um, the working class, lower middle class in there, like the people who are really angry right. at the Republican Party. And there's also people who are quite angry at the Democrat, like sort of Bernie Sanders supporters. Mm -hmm. And they're very different in some ways, but also economically, those right. two groups aren't actually all that different. So if the Republicans make a bid to recapture those people, then that's going to force changes in how the Democrats understand them, them, them sorry, themselves. Right, right. And so what you might get is a kind of Democratic Party that looks urban and multicultural and multi-ethnic and a Republican Party that looks pretty rural and you know retains some of the cultural war aspect of the current, but is going to have to reach out economically to people who don't share that cultural predisposition. Well, all right, so, you know, you're, you're talking about the anger in the electorate. Um, let's segue into your talk about anger in, the, in pol uh, political rhetoric. Um, I mean, clearly there's a lot of that out there as well, but, um, you know, I, I, without you, you know, Stealing That's your own thunder, yeah. right? Can you just say, um, you know, again, how, you, where these trends kind of emerge historically, and if you see something that's kind of something new under the sun as well? You know, it's interesting because the more I look at it, I, Trump is new under the sun, right. and only that he seems to have no filter, no filter. at all, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no, and that it's mainstream. Right? So there's always been political actors without that filter who said kind of awful things. Right. So the American Liberty League would refer to Roosevelt's administration as the Jew deal. Mm -hmm. right? Which, wow. yeah. Yeah, yeah. right? I mean, to, to contemporary ears, right. that's... And it, it was fairly shocking yeah. back then, right. even though anti-Semitism was much less uh, illegitimate right. at the time. So those voices have always been present, but they haven't been quite so prominent. Mm -hmm. Right, so the social media's tendency to amplify, um, and the mass media in general, right, that that hasn't existed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's so many more platforms now right. that it, it does get amplified and echoes around. But the fact of anger um, is, I mean, there's always been 20% ish of our population that has um, bitterly rejected the status quo. Mm -hmm. of defined however, you know, in, mm -hmm. in any mm -hmm. sort of way. They tend, because they're a small group, and not always this, I'm a shifting small group, um, tend to be marginalized, and they're getting a lot of attention right now. But it's still a fairly, like, Trump is not getting a majority right. of right. Republicans, and Sanders is not getting a majority of Clinton, and Clinton has more enthusiasm, like the Clinton, you know, the enthusiasm gap mm -hmm. appears now from what I'm reading to be actually favoring Clinton, not Sanders, which is so not the, the, yeah, yeah, well, it's not the, the median area, right, for right, sure. Right. And so, um, a smart, strategically, a smart candidate will channel the anger without enacting it because we don't want to put lunatics in the White right, House, right, right. right? So you hear um, somebody like Hillary Clinton saying, we'll fight for you, you know, or presidents will say, I'm angry about this. But they, and, and so it sounds like they will defend us, mm -hmm. but when they enact anger, they don't look so much like the grown up in the room and people are a little leery about putting nuclear power in mm -hmm. the hands mm -hmm. of someone who is enraged. Yeah. Because like, there are some political decisions we don't want to be made out of passion. Right. So the way that that works tactically and the way that it is enacted culturally are 
kind of different mm -hmm, things. Mm -hmm. uh, and is there a difference between how that's manifested in the context of a campaign versus the, can the context of governing? Oh, absolutely, right? Because uh, Ted Wendt told us, I don't even know how many decades ago, that the metaphor for campaigning is war, mm -hmm. and the metaphor for governing is not, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And But ever since the permanent campaign, you know, right. dating to the 80s or 90s or whenever you want to place that, um, more and more campaigning is the metaphor of governance. Right. And it's bad for governments because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. war is enemies, war is not compromise. That's not, those are not the premises on which a healthy democracy works. Right. Right. I mean, everything that the, the smart people here at Penn State talk about with democratic deliberation, it doesn't include labeling people as enemies, declaring war on them. Offer, you know, saying they should be punished or exterminated or... So if you look at somebody like FDR, he would always sort of... And Reagan, oh my God, Reagan, right? Mm -hmm. Was a genius at sort of attacking his opponents more in sorrow than in anger. Mm -hmm. And he didn't ever say they were mean-spirited. They were sometimes wrong-headed, but they were always well-intentioned. And so he would always make it possible to work with them the scorched earth, you know, these people can't be compromised with. That that's bad governance and right, it's bad democracy. Right, right, right. But what you're just saying about Reagan, I mean, I, I certainly agree with you. And I remember my grandfather talking about um, FDR and the way he would kind of like belittle the Republicans when he would talk about them, and and do it very effectively. But that's not anger, is it? No, it's not. Right. It's. And he, so he could say that, that um, he was, he always, Roosevelt, in fact, was a genius at putting the anger elsewhere. Uh -huh. So in 36, he says, I've earned the hatred of entrenched right, greed, right. right? Never have the forces of, of entrenched, entrenched greed been so lined up against a candidate. And I welcome their hatred. Yeah. But it wasn't his hatred, right? right? It was, those were the guys who were unhinged. Uh -huh. He was like, you know, I want it said of me that in my first administration, those forces met their match. And in my second, they met their master, right? That's a guy who was going to overcome hatred. Right, right, right. So, yeah, what's not to love about that? Right. Unless you're a Republican. Right, right, right. <laughs> and he was not necessarily fair to the Republicans. Of course. You know, but fairness is not necessarily <laughs> required. And it's and, not necessarily you know. effective either. Yeah. Well, and if you're president, you know, your goal is to get your policies done. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily mm -hmm. to improve the state of American democracy. All right. So um, let me just wrap up with a, with a normative question okay. here. So we have, you know, what I think, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, both a change in the market for media and a change in this kind of permanent campaign, both of which... Uh, undermine the, the kind of prerequisites for American democracy and that um, change the level of expectations with, with regards to what is acceptable for political rhetoric. Okay, w what do we do? <laughs> well, and this is the great genius of, of, of capitalism, right? So I come from a state that was about to pass, right. that passed a religious freedom law that most people that I know at least consider at least on some dimensions to be um, negatively affecting democracy and inclusion and, and those things. And it, my governor vetoed it because corporations like Disney and Marvel and Coca-Cola, Coca which is, you know, hello Atlanta, right. um, said, if you do this, we boycott your state. So for a change, mm -hmm. right? The right. market-driven capitalism actually had a very clear, immediate, discernible, causal relationship to politics. So, if people really wanted better media, they would get it mm -hmm. because they would watch the Lara News Hour. Right. Right. They would be listening to NPR. Right. They would be getting their news from places. And there is clearly a market for that, right? Right? It's a niche it's market. A niche. <laughs> and pe but if you want to fix this, mm -hmm. it's not fair to point at the media mm -hmm. and say you did this mm -hmm. because of course they did. Right. But they did it because that's where their ratings were. Yeah, right. If people didn't watch it, 
they would in fact change their behavior over time. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I mean, I know that in a lot of newsrooms right now, there's a lot of reconsideration of their priorities, whatever. Mm -hmm. Their priority is not American democracy. Right. Their priority is to make money. Right. And news is a huge driver of the money of a television station. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we want better news, watch better news. Like, it's on us. It's yeah, not right, right. as much as it's on them. So that would be my normative statement. All right. If you want good citizenship, be a good citizen. All right. That's a good note on which to end. Mary Stephanie, thank you very thank much you for so coming. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Yeah, same here.